Thank you, uh, Eli. Yeah, uh, when he called me up uh, and said, would I come speak at this conference, um, well, it's kind of hard to refuse him. He's such a well-known guy. And, um, but uh, I said, you know, you sure you want me here? It's, you know, <laughs> I'm not a guy. I don't study energy efficient electronics. Um, in fact, if you look at the, uh, the, the speaker's agenda for this, this conference, and you could ask even a grade school student, like, uh, which one of these doesn't belong? Um, my talk would jump out because my talk is the only one that talks about brains. So I brought a little brain along here just to remind us what we're talking about here. <laughs> this is my little, my little plastic <laughs> brain. Um, okay, so, um, but I do think there's an intersection between my world and your world uh, that will grow over time. And so um, hopefully I'm going to be able to keep you entertained, tell you a few things about brain theory and, 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 and uh, encourage some conversations about how we're going to build silicon-based or whatever the, the technology is, brains. Okay, so that's the time I talk with Rain tells us about the future of uh, silicon. Some of this, just to repeat what um, Eli just said here. Oh, this doesn't progress, but that progresses, so I'm not supposed to look at this. Is that right? Um, just, he, just to reiterate what, what he said here, Dementa is, is an unusual business. It's a for-profit business, but we kind of run it as a, as a combination of a pure science component and a, and a business component. And the pure science component it actually is the, is the more important part in my mind. And so, uh, and that is to re reverse engineer the neocortex. Um, and we want to do this in, a, in, in a, a pure biological form. We want to understand how that structure works uh, exactly. This is not to be inspired. We, it's a, if I had to do nothing else, I would stop right there uh, and say, you know, that's a great thing to do in one's life, try to understand how the brain works. Um, and we're making good progress at that. But it occurred to me very early on that if you, uh, if you really do figure out how the neocortex works, that you can uh, use those principles to build machines that work on the, on the same principles. And uh, this would be the catalyst for the beginning of machine intelligence. So what we want, uh, a second part of Nementa's goal, is to be, uh, play a catalytic role. And remember what a catalyst does. It's something that accelerates the reaction uh, dramatically, but without getting consumed. And so as a startup company, you don't want to be consumed by an industry you create. Um, so, um, and so the idea here is to build machines or software that work on neocortical principles. It is not to model or simulate a human brain. We have no desires to build things that are like humans or solve or, or passes, you know, sort of uh, Turing tests and things like that. It's just that there's a different, brains obviously work on a set of principles, and if we understand those principles, we can do some really amazing things. Uh, Eli mentioned this morning that the goal of his institute is to, to find the replacement of the transistor, which I thought was a great statement. Um, I don't see that anywhere on the website for it, but that was the right... Cat so our goal here is in some sense to replace the program computer with ones that learn, okay? And the idea is that you could build machines that are int truly intelligent, but they ha might have different sensors, they might have different embodiments, they might be faster or larger, and distributed a lot of different ways. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm now going to... Um, I'm going to give you uh, a, a very, very brief history of artificial intelligence. And I, I, I made this slide because I thought I needed to provide context for this audience. So it's just going to be in one slide here. If you go back um, a number of years ago, from the periods from like 1950 to 1990, when people talked about AI, they were always talking about one thing. They were talking about programming computers. And they had no interest in biology. In fact, I remember visiting uh, the MIT AI lab in 1980 um, that I was trying to get be a graduate student there before I came to Berkeley. And, um, and they told me point blank, he says, there's absolutely no reason to study brains. They're just noisy computers. If you want to study brains, go someplace else. I went to Berkeley, but it didn't work out here either. Um, <laughs> that's, I'm serious. That was, the, that was their position at that time. Now, not everybody agreed with that during this period of time. Some people thought, hey, maybe brains could tell us something. And so there was a smaller field of the artificial neural networks, ANNs. And uh, the term they used were these are biologically inspired. Um, and the big success in this field was something called backprop neural networks, backpropagation, uh, which became popular in the mid 80s. Um, but this was definitely a backwater during this time. And no one referred to those things as AI, AI refers to computer stuff. Now, forward to today, and things have changed dramatically. Today, hardly anybody thinks of AI as programming computers to do things. That's, that's sort of like dead almost, uh, and, and that's just computer programming. But today, the term AI refers to the 
the descendants of the artificial neural networks that were created in the 1980s. So the AI is in the, is in the news a lot these days. Almost every day you can see stories about AI at Google or the threat of humanity and things like this. Um, these are basically pretty much, uh, I don't want to overdo it, but basically these are the same types of networks they had back in the mid-80s. Um, they're still based on the same concept of backprop neural networks. They go by a different name now, deep learning, which is a really great name, but it's pretty much the same thing they had in the 80s. What's really different now is we have fast computers and we have big data. And so they figured out how to train monster-sized things, which you couldn't have done back in the 80s. And there have been many successes in this field. This is a very successful field at the moment. Uh, and we, I don't want to take anything away from that. Um, and, uh, but they're still biologically inspired, that's the term they use, but honestly we know now that they're biologically impossible. That the way these networks work are nothing like at all like the way brains work. Now maybe that doesn't matter. Uh, maybe we don't need to know that. Maybe we can, um, can, we can just build the day intelligent machines uh, without really caring how brains work. But just as there was in the past, there's a bunch of people, and I'm included, who don't believe that's true. Uh, that you're not going to get there, that this is going to be like a local minimum. It's just, there's a lot of excitement about it now, it's very valuable, but it's not really on the path to machine intelligence. And um, I don't have a name for those people, so I'll just call them neocortical theorists, okay, of which I'm one. And, um, and the goal there is to really reverse engineer the neocortex. Um, we think of ourselves as biologically constrained, meaning if part of our theories don't match the biology, then they've got to be wrong. And a part of if, uh, and, and, if, and everything we know about the biology has to be consistent with our theories. It's not, you can't just sort of wave your hand and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I'll, I'll, I'll ignore that. And so we test our theories empirically and also in uh, biological ways, you know, through brain uh, anatomy and physiology, things like that. Uh, and what we've learned, what I can tell you, and a part of my story today is that um, the, the sort of the, 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 the artificial neural networks, the deep learning networks we have today are really insufficient for building intelligent machines. Um, and this is still uh, an important thing to do. And I think in the future, I'm very, very confident, confident in saying this, when people talk about the term AI, they're going to be thinking about things that are really brain-like. Um, and that this transition from, like, we can ignore computers completely to we can ignore computers, um, we can ignore brains completely, we can ignore brains mostly, to no, we can't really ignore them. Um, it didn't have to be this way. Maybe humans could have just figured out what intelligence was and we could have built machines that work on those principles. But we have a long history saying that it's surprising the brain still has things to teach us and we need to learn what those are. So that's what we do. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, uh, why should you care about this? Um, why, why does it matter to you guys at all? Well, um, there's a lot of people interested in building hardware to, to model brains, and, and sometimes they use the term neuromorphic, which used to have one meaning, and now it just has a broader meaning about uh, hardware model brains. Pretty much every major semiconductor company in the world has come to Nementor or, or talked to me at one point in time, because they're all interested in this. And uh, why is that? Well, there's a bunch of things that people, they tell me, I'm not telling you, this is what they tell me. Some people talk about the end of Moore's Law. Uh, you guys were discussing that in some of the, in this morning, and what does that actually mean? I'm not going to get into that debate. Some people say, you know, we're tired of the von Neumann architecture. It's getting boring. We need something new. You know, how many, you know, more cores can we put into a chip? Uh, we need something beyond that. The, some people are motivated by the fact there's big data and, and there's machine learning applications. They want to accelerate machine learning applications. Um, and some people come at it from a power efficiency point of view, which is relevant to this group, uh, which they say, man, the, the brain is amazingly power efficient. You know, it just runs on a few watts and look at all it does. Um, so maybe there's something to be learned about that. This is not my area of focus. I'm going to come back to neuromorphic card at the end of my talk. Um, my, my business is being, figuring out how, how the brain works, how the neo neocortex works. Now, just to remind you, when we talk about the neocortex, it's, it's not the entire brain. It's about 75% of the volume of the human brain. It's a big wrinkly thing on top. Um, the old parts of the brain are so stuck up in the middle like a post underneath it. And, um, and the neocortex is pretty much everything we think about as intelligent. You know, my, my speech, language, understanding the world, all high-level vision, planning, all this happens in the neocortex. So I'm going to present a simplistic picture about what the neocortex does and how it works. Um, and just to give you, I don't want to get too lost, but I want to give you the big picture of what's going on here. So I'm not going to talk about the rest of the brain at the moment. Um, so you can think about the neocortex as a, it's like a memory system. That's what it is. When you were born, you have no knowledge about things in the world, very, very little. You can't even see, actually. It's not like you see and you don't know what they are. You actually haven't learned to see yet. 
And um, you don't know about buildings and computers and electronics and presentations and PowerPoint and all this kind of stuff. You have to learn everything. And you learn it through your senses. You, now, the senses are arrays of senses. So your, your retina is about a million sensors. Your body somatic senses are about a million. Your ears are about uh, 30,000. So you have these several million bits coming in on these neuron axons. They all look identical. And they're flowing into the brain. And those patterns on those sensory uh, uh, neurons are changing multiple times a second. They're rapidly changing. So even your eyes are moving three to five times a second, even if you're not aware of it. So completely changing input patterns all the time. My speech is changing on the order of, of tens of milliseconds. And so you have this stream of data coming in. And that's what the brain has to work with. Um, now, of course, the neocortex also generates a lot of behavior. It's generating my speech right now. And uh, if I decide to click this little clicker and things like that. Now, one thing it says, when you think about this, you're constantly interacting with the world through motion, through behavior. And uh, when you think about it, that most of the changes coming out on the sensory stream are because of your own behavior. So as you're sitting in this room, your eyes are moving about. The room's not moving. The room is static. But the input's changing on your, uh, constantly changing on your optic nerve because your eyes are constantly moving. Yes, I move a little bit too, but you're moving your head and your eyes. Similarly, um, if you want to touch something, you have to move your hand over it. Uh, it doesn't happen unless you do that. So, and, and even now, I'm hearing my own speech as I talk here. So it turns out that the majority, not all, but the majority of the changes coming out of that sensory stream are because of your own behavior. And so how, what is this brain doing? Well, we say the neocortex is learning a model of the world. And it learns this uh, primarily through behaving and acting upon the world. It, it wants to build a model of the world, how the world's supposed to work when it, as, as it is observed. This model is a time-based model, and it's a predictive model. Now, what I mean by time-based, the primary memory operation in the neocortex is a memory of time, of sequences, of what follows what, under what conditions. It's not like taking pictures, it's more like a movie. Okay, and it's all about sequence memory, and it's constantly making predictions about what's going to happen next. So it's a, it's a model of a world that says, okay, given what's happened in the past, given my own behaviors, what am I expecting next, what am I expecting next, what am I expecting next, and it's testing those predictions constantly. This is the pilot's little picture I can give you of what the neocortex does. There are three principles we've already picked out of this that I'm going to just harp on. There's more, but these three are, I'm going to focus on. This, uh, these are maybe the top three. First of all, the memory in the brain is a memory of time-based patterns. It is inherent. It's not something that's layered on top of it. It's built into the core memory structure of, the, of how neurons work. The second thing is you really can't understand how an intelligence system, you can't build an intelligence system or understand intelligence unless you include the sensory motor integration component. It's not something you can just say, oh, I don't, that's an option. I'll act sometime. No, it's part of how you learn and part of how you sense. And the third thing is it is continuously learning. There's never a batch process. It's not like, oh, here's the training set and here's the test set. You know, we force that on kids in school, perhaps, but that's not how it works. You're constantly learning all the time. Every time new input comes in, it's continually adapting uh, in real time. So these are some of the high-level principles here. Now, I'm going to dive into a bit more neuroscience theory here uh, before I come back up and talk about uh, implications for you. So hopefully you'll find this interesting. Uh, let's just talk about the architecture of this thing, uh, the neocortex. Uh, I've shown a human neocortex, and there's a rat neocortex next to it, because the principles I'm about to tell you are common throughout all mammals. All mammals have a neocortex, and it doesn't really matter which mammal we're talking about. These principles are the same. Now, the, the cortex is really a sheet of cells. Uh, if you could take it out of your head right now, a human neocortex, this is a good model from a human neocortex. It's about 1,000 square centimeters, about 2.5 millimeters thick. It gets wrinkled up to fit in your head, but it's really a sheet. Uh, very thin, and um, it's remarkably uniform. That is, it's got a lot of detail in it, but no matter where you look, this detail is almost the same everywhere. In fact, it's very hard to tell what species or what part of the neocortex you're looking at because it almost looks identical. Um, and functionally, we now know it's functionally the same. This is hard to believe, but it, basically the neocortex is doing the same thing everywhere, even though there's parts of it are vision and parts of it are hearing. It's the same basic process. Um, this is how it got very large so quickly. This is why we are so adaptable, because we have a universal learning algorithm going on here. The neocortex is divided into regions. Those regions are defined by connectivity. 
They're not visual. You can't see them, but the neurons connect between areas in the neocortex, and if you separate out those areas, you find that they form a hierarchy. It's a fairly complex looking hierarchy, but this picture is, uh, gives you a sense for it. Information flows up the hierarchy, and information flows down the hierarchy, and each of these layers here is just a different section of the neocortex. If you then slice through the two and a half millimeters, <coughs> what do you see? So this little picture shows the two and a half millimeter slice. The first uh, level of organization you're going to see is cellular layers. When I say a cellular layer, it's not one cell in a layer. It's like a, there's a, a, a very thick, dense mat of cells, but they, we basically divide it into four cellular layers. You can count, count them differently. They, surprisingly, they're, they're labeled two, three, four, five, and six. One doesn't really have many cells in it. Um, the next thing, if you look a little closer in the microscope, you'd see that there are these neurons, and the neurons, the next level or or organization is called a mini column. The neurons are um, the neurons that are aligned in a, ver a very ver vertical stripe across the different layers here. And um, sometimes you can actually see the mini columns. They're visually seeable in the microscope. Sometimes they're not, but they're real. They come about the way the brain uh, develops. And all the neurons in a little column across the surface there have a very similar response properties. They kind of tend to represent the same thing in the world under some conditions. If you dive down even further, you can actually look at the neuron. This is, this is your pick classic pyramidal neuron, which makes up the vast majority of the neurons in the neocortex. Um, it's a fairly complex thing. They have anywhere between five and 10,000 synapses on them, connections. There are some neurons uh, in the brain, actually, in the pyramidal cells that have over 30,000 synapses on them. So thousands and thousands of synapses. Those synapses are arranged on the dendrite. They're actually not connected to the cell body itself. The cell body has no excitatory synapses. Um, they're all on those dendritic trees that uh, we call the dendrites. And if you look at the dendrite, and there's a picture one on the bottom here, I hope you can see that. Um, that's a little section of the dendrite, and there's these little uh, um, the synapses. You can see them along there, along these little spines. They're about a micron apart, uh, stretched out there. Um, we now know, and it's been known for maybe 15 years, that the dendrites themselves are active processing units. They're not just a surface area expansion. And what happens if you have some number, maybe 15 to 20 synapses, become active at the same time nearby on a dendrite, so they're co-located in space and time, it has a very large effect on the cell. If the synapses become active at different points in time or different points in the dendritic tree, it has almost no effect on the cell. And you can think of these as, as coincidence detectors. Um, so, but it's an active dendrite. And then finally, we now know that Learning, we used to, for many, many years, people think of learning as the modification of the weight or the, the efficacy of a synapse. This is what you learned in any neural network theory. We now know that neurons form memory primarily by forming new synapses. They grow new ones rapidly, and they disappear. If you looked at a particular neuron in your brain today, and you look at tomorrow, you'd see a good percentage of, of the synapses have changed. And uh, they grow. They just literally grow these spines and retract them and so on. It's a much more powerful form of learning. Uh, than modification of synapses. And by the way, synapses are highly stochastic. They don't work half the time. Literally 50% of the time, they, don't, they, just, they just crap out on you. Um, so it's much more powerful to make a set of these and connect a set of them to recognize patterns. So this is, this is basically the system we want to understand. If we can understand how all this works, then we've got a good theory about neocortex. So do we have any such theory? Well, we have, we, yeah, we do. We understand a lot of it. We don't understand a lot of it, too, but I'm going to tell you what we do have. We have an overall theory, which we call hierarchical temporal memory, or just HTM. It's kind of, the, it's basically a name for neocortical theory. The terms essentially says it, it's a hierarchy of identical regions. That's fact. Um, each region is primarily a memory of time or sequences. People will admit that, but most people don't think of it that way, but that's, I'm arguing, is, is the case. Uh, we know that stability increases as you go up the hierarchy. So as you go up the hierarchy, cells tend to represent things over a longer period of time, a larger period of space. And then as you go down the hierarchy, things unfold in time and space. So that's kind of the basic idea. Um, and then what we want to know is, like, well, how, what's actually going on in these layers and in a region exactly? What are these neurons doing? How do they implement this? And so on. So um, digging, digging down one more step deeper here. Hopefully you're finding this interesting. Um, now let's look at a slice of the cortex here, okay? So I'm showing you these, uh, these four layers of cells. I'm showing you little, those little dots and neurons are lined in the mini columns. Um, we can basically say two of these layers are a feed-forward pathway, two of them are basically a feed-backward pathway. That comes from the neuroanatomy. And what we believe, and what we, what we, pr we, 
we're predicting, which is a part of the theory that we do, is that all of these layers are implementing a, a form of sequence memory. Um, it's a, there's a common thing that's going on between all neurons, which is learning sequences. And the different layers are doing sequences for different things. So let me give you an example, and this is as deep as we're going to go. Um, the inputs to, a, uh, to the cortex, or to any region of the cortex, are not just the sensor data. We actually what you think, oh, I'm getting input from the eyes, or I'm getting input from the ears, and things like that. But you also get a copy of the motor commands that the rest of the brain is operating on. So when, when the visual cortex gets a new sensory input, it also gets a copy of how, how the body just moved the eyes. Um, and so this is important because if you want to recognize something like a face, and your eyes are moving over the face all the time, it, it appears stable to you, but it's not stable. The input's changing. If, if the inputs just change and you didn't know that you moved your eyes, it would look like the world is jumping around. But it doesn't look that way. How is it that's possible? Well, if you could match up the motor behavior with the current sensory input, and then you can predict what the next sensory input would be, then you say, ha, this is what, as I expected. If I move from left eye to right eye, I expect to see the eye here, and so on. So there's a type of what we call an inference, which is pattern recognition, uh, a, a sort of a sensory uh, sequence memory of sensory motor inference, which would be uh, incorporating uh, uh, motor behavior. But some patterns in the world, like my speech or like music, um, do not have a motor component to them. They're just what we call high order sequences, meaning they're very long sequences, they can be long, they can have repeated elements, they can, uh, they can merge and come apart. It's a very complex stream coming in here. And so, uh, does this have a, uh, this have a uh, I'm gonna push a button here for a laser, is this right? Yeah. So you actually have to have what we call a high order inference. And so we believe actually what's going on in these two layers, that you have these two basic types of inference, pure temporal and sensory motor temporal. Uh, the layer, and then that feeds up to the next higher region, the cortex. Layer five cells are the cells that are generating motor behavior. So right now, there are neurons in my head in layer five, in, in one part of my neocortex, and those layer five cells are coming on and off making my speech right now. It's just hard to imagine, but it's true. Um, and so these project down to motor things that generate motor behavior. And, I'll, and layer six is a feedback, it's, it's kind of a tension. So, so this is your basic idea here and why you might have different layers of cells. And a couple of things to notice that these basic operations exist in all cortical regions. So there are no pure sensory regions. There are no things like, oh, this is a region region, that's a motor region. Every, we now know that every region is sensory motor. There is, this is an integrated behavior. This is true for everywhere in the neocortex. Um, and it works across modalities. This is true in low-level vision and hearing and language and so on. Now, this is definitely more complicated than your typical artificial neural network. Uh, if you know anything about ANNs, there's nothing like this. But so this, there's some suggestion here that this stuff is important <laughs> to intelligence, uh, but it's not too complicated that we can't understand it. Uh, with diligence and application, we can figure out how this stuff works. And what we focused on for a number of years, and we figured out, I'm very confident we figured this out, we figured out exactly how the basic sequence memory algorithm works. And you can apply it in different ways, but it's sort of the core memory learning system. Um, and uh, I'd love to tell you all about it. We've documented it. There's white papers on it. I have other talks online about it. I don't have time to go into all the details. It's really cool, and I suggest you look at it. I'm just uh, I'm going to tell you a few things about it, and then I'm going to leave you a little hanging on the actual details of all the stuff because we won't have time. But I do want to talk about the neuron because that's important for this group because you might be thinking about building hardware, and you might be thinking about building neurons and hardware and things like that. So let me just tell you a little bit about neurons, a little bit more, so you get a sense for what's, what some of the issues are. Uh, this is your typical artificial neural network neuron that's used in deep learning or any kind of most artificial neural networks. They have very, very relatively few synapses, maybe dozens or hundreds. Um, they basically form an output by some sort of you know, input times weight, sum them together, and you modify, you learn by modifying the synapses. As I mentioned before, this is a real neuron. They have thousands of synapses. They have active dendrites. Cells recognize hundreds of unique patterns on these, pat these dendrites, and they learn by growing new, um, new, new synapses. The also, the inputs to the neuron are segregated into different regions, and they have different effects on the body, uh, on this neuron. So the feed forward input to the neuron, uh, is shown in green here, has a very, it's near the cell body, not on the cell body, but near the cell body. That is really what makes the cell fire. These, these other inputs, the contextual input and the feedback input, when the cell recognizes patterns there, it doesn't make the neuron fire, but it depolarizes the neuron, and it acts as a form of prediction. So even in the single neuron, 
we have the ability for the neuron to respond to a feed-forward pattern, but also predict its activity based on either top-down or contextual input, uh, so on. We model this in our software simulations using something called, not surprising, an HTM neuron for no, no other reason. Um, and you can see what we do is we model the dendrites as a set of uh, an array of coincidence detectors. We put them in different groups, feedback, contextual, and feed-forward. Um, we model the learning in, this, in these, um, uh, these HTM neurons is through the growth of synapses. Uh, so we model the growth, but, uh, but we actually, the, the weights of the synapses, we, we make them binary. So what we can do is we can take a layer of cells. So now I'm, I'm just talking about what one layer here is. And this is a picture of one of our simulations of just one layer of cells. So you can see the, the, this is only four cells deep in the columns. This is, this is very small. Our actually simulations are much bigger than this. Um, much, much later. This is something you can see. And, um, and this, each of these little cubes is one of these HTM neurons. And you're just going to have to take it from me that this, if you do this right, and it's not hard, this creates a very cool uh, distributed memory of sequences. Uh, and what I mean distributed means there's no center of control, there's no point of failure. You can make a sheet of these as big as you want. Um, it, it, it's all based on local interactions, and so it can learn sequences in different parts of the, sequen uh, the sheet. It uh, has a lot of desirable properties. So it learns, recognizes, and recalls high-order sequences. And again, high-order sequences can be like melodies and, and um, long, complex patterns. Um, it's constantly predicting the next inputs. In this picture, the yellow neurons are actually uh, the, the ones that are depolarized. They're making predictions, and the red ones are the actual ones that are active. And interestingly, this system can predict multiple patterns at the same time, lots of them. It can predict maybe 20 or 30 things at once and not get confused in the same set of neurons. This is because this is a property of the fact that these are all sparse activations, which I don't have time to get into today. These are some of the, the issues about this memory. It's high capacity. It works on local learning rules. It's extremely fault tolerant. There's no sensitive parameters. It really works pretty uh, reliably. Um, and this has been tested extensively and documented in many, many ways. Uh, I claim that this kind of sequence memory uh, is an essential component of intelligence, whether it's biological intelligence or machine intelligence. It's sort of a founding memory principle. And if we're going to build hardware to support machine intelligence, it has to be consistent with these kind of neurons and these kind of structures. Uh, it can't ignore that stuff. OK. So where are we in our, in our sort of theoretical uh, research map? We've, we really understand how the basic sequence memory for high order sequences, what we think is going on in layers two, three, is going on. Uh, this has been extensively tested. We applied it to many commercial applications. I'll tell you about them in a second. We've done a lot of work on understanding how the same mechanism can done, uh, do sensory motor sequences. Um, we haven't made anything commercial with that yet, so, but we have documented it. We have a paper out on that. Uh, we're in the middle of trying to understand exactly how uh, the, the cortex generate motor behavior, and we don't understand all of it. We have a lot of the mechanisms, but we're still, we're still working on that. What we decided to do is said, okay, let's uh, test this and make sure it really works. So we took this basic model, and we said, let's uh, build some uh, um, proof that we can build some things on this. So um, you can apply this to streaming data applications. Essentially, if anything, I've got some data coming from some place, I can build, run it through this and build a model of it. So that's what we did. So we've taken this basic model. We said you can take a data stream, you run it through an encoder, which is like a sensory organs. It turns it into something called a sparse, oops, a sparse distributed representation, um, which is the key to how the whole thing works, so sparse activations. And uh, then you run it through the HTM, and you can make predictions, detect anomalies, and do classifications of data streams. It's all about streaming data, not spatial patterns. So there's lots of things that generate data these days, the whole internet of things. But you know, there's tons and tons of things that anything has a sensor can generate data. And um, we've come up with a number of encoders that take numbers and categories, dates and times, even GPS coordinates and words. As long as you can get them into an SDR, the sparse distributed representation thing works. So I'm not gonna, this is not a commercial sales here. I just want to give you a flavor for what we've done so far. We've done it for IT monitoring, um, looking at metrics coming off of servers. Uh, Amazon's infra infrastructure, for example, works very, very well to detect the anomalies. We've been able to detect uh, anomalies in, in human behavior, looking for people who are acting differently than they normally act, by the, how they're using keystrokes and things like that. We are able to use it for pr uh, prediction and anomaly detection in financial data streams like stock volumes and so on. A, you can actually download this app and try it on your cell phone right now if you have an Android. We applied to geospatial tracking, and we even done a lot of very, it's working with a company I'll tell you about in a moment, doing interesting work in natural language search. So these are some of the things we've applied it to. 
Um, our business model is essentially a licensing model. So we have two, model, uh, two licensees today. One's this company called Cortical IO, who's using HTM principles in natural language processing. That is a really cool company. You should check it out. Can you tell us what HTM is again? Hierarchical temporal memory. That's the, that's the basic name for our theory. Uh, it's a memory of hier hierarchical memory of sequences. That's everything we do. Sorry about that. Um, so that's basically, the, 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 when I talk about HTM here, it's using that sequence memory. It's using all of our code, okay? Uh, the stuff I was talking about. We uh, uh, used to check these guys out. It's very cool. We just, uh, this week announced, um, there's a company, it's going to go under, uh, under the name of Grokstream. They took our uh, demo app for IT monitoring and they're making a commercial product out of that. Uh, so they're just going up and running. So our business model if, is basically people want it, we'll license it to them and they can do with it. Uh, what they want. We have a number of research partnerships, uh, and this has been going on longer. We have a, about 18 months now working with IBM in Almaden under a guy named Dr. Winfrey Wilkie, and they have been working on a complete technology stack for our HTM um, uh, neural models. Uh, there's a guy at DARPA called Dan Hammerstrom who's got a program called the Cortical Processor, which is based on HTM. We did a, uh, this last year, we did a, a collaboration with the University of Heidelberg, Dr. Carl Hahn Myers. He's the uh, sort of hardware component of the Human Brain Project. They have a chip called HiCAN, and they tried to port our, our algorithms to the HiCAN chip. We were, we were able to do that, but not easily. And we have a collaboration going on with uh, Dr. Matthew Larkin, who's one of, he's a neuroscientist, one of the leaders in the world on active dendrites, and he's taken an interest in our theories and putting together a testing, uh, biological testing protocol for that. So these are really great for, this, uh, for us. We've also taken all of our software and everything and put it into an open source project uh, that Eli mentioned called NUPIC. You can find that at Nementa.org. The algorithms are documented. There's multiple independent implementations of these algorithms. So that tells you that we've documented them sufficiently. Uh, if there's other people who've created them and are using them. Uh, and uh, we've put all of our software up there uh, and as well as the application software for those demo apps. And there's lots of discussion groups and other things. We're running a contest this fall um, up, up there as well. This is a chart from last year basically showing that the open source community is healthy and growing. This is over the past year uh, growth in a, a whole bunch of new metrics, but almost tripling in size. Okay. Um, let me just tell you a few words about neuromorphic hardware. This is my last uh, slide before the summary. Um, the term neuromorphic hard drive, I believe, was originally came from Carver Mead and originally meant using the analog sections, uh, the analog properties of semiconductors to model the neural processes. It has become to mean a broader thing now. Nowadays, people use this term um, to mean anything that's modeling brain like stuff. So, apologies to Carver. Um, I, I break it into two different groups, and I, did, I couldn't think of a good name for this. I just, I, I'll call it the neuron approach. Don't pay attention to that word too much. But the idea here is these people said, like, okay, um, let's try to figure out how we're going to model spiking neurons, and let's how we're going to figure out modifiable synapses. So there's been a lot of work in people trying to use emristors to model modifiable synapses, seeing how many states of um, memory could they get in an emristor to model the different states uh, of a memory in a, in a particular uh, synapse. The goal has been primarily to low power and high speed. Oops. Um, oops. Um, and examples of these, uh, there's a chip at IBM, a different group, not the group we work with, called the True North chip, uh, created by uh, Darmendra Moda. Um, the HiCan chip I mentioned a minute ago from the Human Brain Project in Europe. Qualcomm has announced a chip in this area. Uh, HRL did a, uh, did a chip like this as part of the, a DARPA program. And I have a lot of problems with these. Um, I don't find them very useful. First of all, analog synapses in spiking neurons from a theoretical point are not needed. The theory tells us that way. I, I didn't come in knowing that, but that's what I believe now, that, that the brain has spikes because that's how it learned, that's how nature can form a communication wire. <laughs> but it's not an essential part of the theory about what's actually going on. And similar, synapses they're so stochastic that who cares if you can get 32 levels of precision on them? It, it does not really matter. The theory doesn't require that. Um, and the, the problem is that these chips that people created are incompatible with the things we now know are essential. They're incompatible with neurons with active dendrites, and they're incompatible with neurons with thousands of synapses. So most of these chips limit the number of synapses you can have on a neuron to maybe 256. I've got to have 10,000. Uh, that's what the theory tells us. So I can't, I can't use that stuff. When we, we ported our algorithms to the high can chip, we had to do an unbelievable bunch of crazy stuff to make that happen. Um, 
some of these chips can't learn, and, so, and almost all of them can't learn continuously. So they kind of fail in that regard, too. And the basic problem is that they were designed, whoops, they were designed without a system level theory. They were just people saying, okay, we'll put a bunch of neurons or synapses, or, and we'll have someone else will figure out what to do with it. Well, I'm figuring out what to do with it, and I can't use that stuff. Um, there's a different approach, which is the systems approach, uh, and these people have said, okay, it's all about connectivity. And that's the problem that brains have. And we have huge amounts of wiring in the brain. That's true. And so their goals are scalability and configurability of connectivity. Two examples of this are there's a, a project uh, in England at the University of Manchester called Spinnaker. It's been around for a number of years. They take thousands of ARM um, uh, processors and they, and they basically uh, create a large connectivity scheme, a toroidal, toroidal connectivity scheme between them. Very clever. Uh, oops, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button here. Everyone does. Um, the, the other project at IBM, the, the people we're working with uh, under Wilkie, they are working on a different type of system, a wafer scale system. And I'll just take, I'm going to show you one picture of that. This is from uh, a presentation that Winfried Wilkie did earlier this year at a, at a neuromorphic hardware conference called NICE. And this is, he's showing what the, the, the systems that uh, IBM is working on. These are all inspired by HTM theory, by our, not us. Um, and what they're doing is they're doing a, a wafer scale integration, but stacked wafer scale integration. And they've got vias between, um, between the, the, the wafers. And they have a clever way of paring down the wafers to make it all really thin. I'm not going to go into it. But he presented this slide, so I figured I could present this slide. Um, the point here is you've got now a hierarchical deep memory system. The, the wafers are primarily memory. And interspersed amongst the memory is uh, simple processors, simple ARM processors. So actually modeling the neuron is easy. It's the connectivity is the hard part. And routing, so it's all about routing. The memory is almost all about routing where the information has to go because the neuron has to send signals to 10,000 other neurons simultaneously. Okay. So let um, me just end with my summary here. Uh, my first thing is I claim that progress is being made in reverse engineering the, neuro in reverse engineering the neocortex. Uh, I'm very confident in the things I told you. Uh, I believe that in the future we're all going to look back and understand that true intelligent machines are going to be based on those principles. Uh, primarily sequence memory, hierarchy, sensory motor integration, online learning. Um, maybe we'll get, these ways, get here without looking at brains. I think the brain still has a lot to teach us. And, uh, and that hardware for machine intelligence must support these components I've been talking about. And it doesn't need to support these components, which I don't think are uh, important, but this is where a lot of people spend their time. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. I don't know how much time I took, so if you have still time for questions. Yeah, we have time for questions. Uh, so, uh, I'm, well, I'm kind of amazed by all this, so let me see if I can summarize what I learned. Uh, you, you had a, um, a model for what was happening that was level two, three. So yeah. you used what you learned in uh, essentially analyzing the biology of level two, three, and used that to inspire you uh, in uh, what kind of hardware to make. So the only thing I could think of is trying to make the hardware to look a little bit like level two, three. <laughs> But on the other hand, uh, it, it also inspired some kind of software. And uh, I suppose the way it was organized in level two, three, I guess you could, organize, you could sort of think that would be an inspiration for a software approach. Now, that's what I got. But I have a feeling that uh, maybe I didn't get it quite. How do you go from what you learned in level two, three to uh, software products? And why do we have to imitate it Okay. Hardware. All right. A uh, couple of different questions there. So let me just yeah. dissect so, so yeah. them. First of all, let me make it clear. All the levels, all those layers of cells in the neocortex, they're very similar. They all made neurons with thousands of synapses with the same properties I was talking about. What really distinguishes between the different layers, the layers two, three, four, five, and six, is what they're connected to. So the principle, the, 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 the idea we're working on, which I feel fairly confident, is that they're all doing the basic same memory or, uh, principle. Um, but it's what they're connected to that makes them different. So it's, it's not just a model of layer two, three. It's a model of all the layers, and by connecting them different, to different things, you get different behaviors. Okay. We, of course, we wanted to test this. We, wrote, we had to test this, and we tested it in software. And we do this. We run, we've run millions and millions of these models now. Um, and we do it in software because it's, this, it's a, a way of empirically testing them, see if they work, what are the behaviors, what are the problems. Um, we've applied it all different ways. We've, it's, it's our main tool. Now, we can do today, we have, we've spent a huge amount of time optimizing the software. 
And so today, if I have a typical one of our networks, it's fairly small. It is um, 2,048 columns, each of 32 neurons, so it's 65,000 neurons. Each one has maybe a several thousand synapses, 5,000 synapses. That is about one millionth the size of a human neocortex. It's about one thousandth the size of a mouse neocortex. Okay, so that's what we're, that's what we're modeling in software today. Um, we have optimized that tremendously, as much as we can you know, hold the engineering team on this, and we can now run that, and basically in about 30 milliseconds, we can do a complete learning inference prediction step. So that's, that's our maximum performance. I can do a lot with that. I can do a lot of interesting commercial applications with that. I can't build a brain. I can't even get close. I'm talking about one millionth the size of a human brain, and it's running at 30 milliseconds a cycle. So we cannot really get beyond the most minuscule stuff here without some sort of hardware acceleration. It's going to be necessary, um, and uh, I can't wait around for it. So I'm trying to figure out everything I can do in software today by building systems that are limited but can do something really useful. But if we want to build systems that are really interesting and big, we need to have hardware support. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, I think so. And um, uh, so what I understand is uh, by uh, modeling uh, the brain, uh, it, uh, you, you can model these things in software. So you go ahead and model them in software. Of course, they could lead to problems that uh, runaway conditions, things that, are, uh, that can't work. And therefore, you test against those. Yes. And then, having reached that point, you can then apply it uh, to specific problems like uh, recognizing uh, patterns yeah. in uh, banking and so yeah, forth. That's right. We spent, in fact, when we came out, this, this thing I presented here is actually we, the basic memory algorithm I talked about uh, was learned, we figured it out over fi about five years ago. We spent an entire year, just one year, our entire company testing it in software. No, just, mm -hmm. just parameterizing it, characterizing it. Um, understanding it deeply, and then we said, okay, it really does work. It does all the things we thought it was going to do, uh, and we understand its capabilities. And then we started to say, let's start applying it to things. But it's, it's a hard, it's, you know, it's complex. These are complex systems. You can't, uh, there's no single equation that describes how this whole thing works. You know, it's not like physics. There's a question over there. Yes. Uh, great presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, so, uh, according to my understanding, the main problem of uh, artificial ne neural network was uh, the fact that it is not error-free. Uh, so, there was always a chance of having error. So, unlike the CPUs that maybe uh, we want to have 100% success rate. So, did you solve that problem in this? Um, I, I, I hope so. everyone heard the question. I, I don't think that, I wouldn't agree with that assessment, that the main problems of neural networks is they're not error-free. Uh, let me phrase it a different way. Brains generalize, right? We don't want brains, we want brains to generalize. We, uh, in fact, the input coming on your eyes and your ears and your skin, the input coming into your brain has never repeated once in, in your life. It is always different. And, um, and so we have to somehow extract what are the structure in that data stream and yet apply it to new ones. And so we inherently want the system to mistake, if you want to call it that way, new inputs as being the same as old inputs. <laughs> we want to say, you know, uh, this is actually different, but I think it's the same as something I saw before. Now, you might call that an error. <laughs> um, if, you, uh, if you didn't do that, then you're like those people who are savants. You know, they see everything, they never, see any, they never, they never generalize. Everything is new and fresh. They, they, that's a problem. So it's not a matter of error. Um, uh, I, I don't think of these things as error. It's more a matter of uh, how do I get them to generalize? How do I get them to work in, the, in a noisy environment? Um, not like, oh, there's a proper answer that it should always be exactly X. Does that, help? Does that sort of answer your question or no? Yes. Just for the digital application, is also the same answer? I mean, but I mean like if we apply it to some other problem? Yeah, I mean, if you want to, let's uh, make a CPU out of this. Uh, make no? a, a CPU like this. A CPU? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, I, I would think making, you're making a memory chip that works like this, right? Um, uh, let me just try to do it again. Uh, a couple, just a couple things. First of all, the algorithms are highly, highly fault tolerant. So, for example, I could take that, um, that memory mo model. I, I didn't explain how it works, but I could take that one. I can literally kill off 40% of the neurons, and it still works amazingly well. It'll, it, it, it's just incredible. So it has inherent fault tolerance built into the system, just like in brains. Your neurons are dying all the time. They, they crap out all the time. They, they just don't work very well. Um, 
So the, the system is inherently fault tolerant. And, it just, and that's a nice thing about it. If you want to get the scalability, whether it's you're trying to get the low power, get the voltage down, or whatever you're trying to do, you know, you can work in a different range here and not worry about having it. You can have 20% error, and the system works fine. So um, we have to rethink ourselves of what it means to have a, 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 an error-free environment. We want those properties. Thank you. Jeff, um, how important is it for you to have new hardware versus software? In other words, if you want to make progress in your company in this field, is the limit software, or is the limit being able to have hardware that would be able to run software at larger scale? Um, I, I kind of tried to say this earlier. I'll rephrase it. Um, hardware takes a long time, and it's really hard. Um, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you guys do that. <laughs> um, you know, I was really in interesting to talk this morning about the agile development, right? Because, you know, in software, we do, we do agile development in the Menta. But, you know, we can do a release every day. You guys can't do that. Um, I don't think you can. Uh, but um, so that's a, you work on a different time frame. So we usually when people come to me and they say, hey, we're going to work on harder for this, I say, great, I really need your harder, but I can't wait around for you. You might take five years to get there. I can't, I don't know. So we, our research is all focused on software emulation, and I, I have a lot we can still do in software, pure software. I can add that layer five. I can layer, layer, layer four, layer five. The little teeny section of Cortex, I can model all those layers in software. Uh, I can't build big systems, so, but there's some things I can do in software, so I'm going to stick to those things, and I've got a lot of, I still have a lot to do. Um, however, if I had hardware support, I could do those better, and I could do more, and I could do them faster. Some of our simulations take a long time. If I start, you know, when we first implement some new feature of the algorithm, we might do it in Python, and it runs much slower, and then you're waiting hours and hours and hours for results. Ugh, we hate that. Um, but I can't get big. So um, it's kind of like, I really need the hardware. We are going to need the hardware. The whole industry in the world is going to need hardware to build intelligent machines. If you haven't figured out already, I think this is the most important thing humans could be working on. Um, and, um, and so we need to get there. But I, I, as a little company with limited resources, I can't wait around for it. So um, we, we have a lot to do that we don't like. But we're happy to collaborate with people. And uh, we just started, we st we've had a number of conversations with Intel. <coughs> Intel wants to test these algorithms. But we have this, you know, we're doing this thing with uh, IBM. And, um, so the, hopefully those guys will come along and, and we'll meet somewhere in the middle. Hi. Uh, you may have mentioned this before. I couldn't make it until now. Uh, what do you have in place of uh, graded synaptic weights? How do you solve that? How do yeah, you, yeah. Let me how do you do what they do without um, it? I, I, I have a picture here of it. Hang on. Yeah, okay. Okay, let me just... Uh, we're going to focus on this part down here, okay? What we want to do is, is we want to, where's the question from here? What we, what we want to do on a neuron, just I'll, bear with me and I'll come back to the slide. We want a section of a dendrite to form 15 to 20 synapses to a subset of a large number of cells that might be active. We only have to connect to like 15 of them. And there might be thousands of active cells, and I want to recognize that pattern. But I, only want to do, I only need to form like 15 synapses. Mathematically, it's all you need to do. And so we want to form new connections to active cells. The way we do that is our, we, we model a synapse with something called permanence. And it models the growth. Imagine I have an axon and a dendrite. They don't have a synapse. And what happens is I grow, <laughs> literally I grow a spine and I make a connection between them. And the, and the permanence goes between 0 and 1. It's a scalar. And where 0 means there's nothing growing between these two. And 1 means there's a big synapse. And along, somewhere along the way, maybe 0.2 or 0.3, we actually form the synapse, meaning it's up to, up to that point, it's, there's no functional connection. After that point, it's, it, there is a functional connection, but the weight of the synapse is 1. So the, the weight of the synapse is binary. Um, either it's connected or it's not. But I have a scalar which, which suggests the growth. And why do I do this? Well, this, was, this is what the biology looks like. But the point is, if I train, I, I use heavy in learning. And I, when I learn, I move the permanence of a synapse. And I sort of say, OK, every time I have a learning event, I want to increase that permanence. At some point, the synapse becomes functional. Prior to then, it isn't. But maybe that was noise. So it had to repeat a certain number of times. And then beyond that permanence, uh, beyond that threshold, if I go all the way up to here, I have, I have something that's been trained so many times, I, want, I don't want to forget it very easily. So it's like a, a more permanent memory. 
So we have a difference. We have two synapses. It's just like in the brain. You have two synapses that are both functionally equivalent, but one will last longer than the other because that one has been reinforced more. So this is how we measure it. And we don't need a graded thing because we have to have a set of them. If we have a set of those synapses, that's what I need. And any one of them is not important. As long as I have 15 to 20 of them, um, then that's good enough. And, and so I could drop off any one or two of them. It really doesn't matter. It's the set that matters, but I do need to model the growth. So this is a very unusual way of doing it. Um, but this actually matches the biology. Okay. So I was, I was thinking that we have to ask the audience for very short questions. Uh, but now I realize we have to ask for very short answers. Oh, but it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> but Jamie, I hope you have a short one. Yeah. Could you provide any insight or specific examples on how we can go from the uh, biology or the experiment to this theory? How are you able to make that connection between what we're seeing? How do you develop your theory from what you see uh, biologically? Okay, um, it's just classic. Just, I'll be, a quick answer. Top down, bottom up. Oh, is that quick enough? <laughs> uh, uh, look, we have theoretical constraints that are sort of deduced. Like, I need, to have, I need to be able to have stability through movement of my sensors. I need to be able to play back sequences and, and make predictions. These are theoretical constraints that I say the brain must do these things. Then we study a great deal of anatomy and physiology. I, I have a pretty deep knowledge of anatomy and physiology in, in, in cortical stuff. And so the anatomy and physiology tells you, oh, by the way, synapses are stochastic. By the way, they, they form. Oh, by the way, uh, there's a whole field of active dendrites now. That's what they do. This is what the physical, that's the bottoms up. Right? So we said, here's the theoretical things we have to do. Here's the, the, the substrate we have to make it work on. And you look for that connectivity. And initially, it's very, very hard. Initially, you feel like it's impossible. But when, it actually, when you actually they match up, so many constraints are satisfied simultaneously that you just have a tremendous confidence that the answer is correct. It is not easy. It's not like you can just pick something out of the hat and make this stuff work. It's really hard to get this to work. If I'm going to use biology as a set of constraints, and there's so much unassimilated biology, meaning there's so many papers in neuroscience that have never been assimilated in any theoretical framework, that it's, you, just, you can need thousands and thousands of papers, and you have to sort of assimilate them in here. So uh, the, one of the things that you mentioned that uh, was not recognized by earlier neural networks is the number of connections. I, you talked about 1,000 or 10,000 connections, yeah. and that was not previously considered. Now, uh, well, they know that. They just don't have a theory for it. So. Right. Uh, but uh, that's also something that I think we can do in, uh, uh, in uh, electronics, and in, uh, particularly in optoelectronics. We can provide an unbelievable density of connections. There's a guy, uh, that's interesting. I'm happy to hear that. There's a guy at uh, Sandia uh, Labs, um, Murat Okandam, who is a, who's a fan of optic connectivity. <laughs> And he's, he talks about it greatly, and I, that's fantastic. But other people disagree. I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't okay. know what's going to okay. win. Okay. It's, uh, we, we just have to do <laughs> it. Someone has okay. to figure this out. Okay. With that, let's uh, thank uh, Jeff Hawkins again. Thank you.